afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with today's big coronavirus update. We've got lots of things to cover today. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a board-certified emergency medicine physician, also a functional medicine physician here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We've been doing coronavirus updates since the beginning of the pandemic, and we've got a big one today. We've uh, started spreading these things out a little bit, but we've got a lot to cover today. We're going to be covering about some big case spikes, both here locally and nationwide, since we've started to open things up. We're also going to be talking about whether the protests we've seen nationwide are going to have an effect on cases. We're going to talk about the retraction of this big hydroxychloroquine study. And also, we're going to be talking about some results of the first randomly controlled trial using hydroxychloroquine in prophylaxing against the coronavirus. We're also going to be talking about is possibly coronavirus, maybe a vascular disease, and we're going to be talking about some wellness content that we have coming up. First off, we're going to be talking about numbers, 6.6 .6 million cases worldwide. We've had 391,000 deaths worldwide, 2.9 million recoveries here in the U.S. We're at 1.9 million confirmed cases, 110,000 deaths, including over 1,100 deaths just in the last day. 439,000 recoveries here in North Carolina, 32,000 cases of confirmed cases of the virus and 1,000 deaths. Case spikes. Well, you know, we've been seeing very big case spikes, especially in the last eight days just here uh, in North Carolina. We've been seeing triple digit increases in Mecklenburg County, which is where our clinic is located. Uh, following our phase two uh, opening here locally, we've been seeing over 100 new cases a day uh, locally and, and big spikes in North Carolina. Now, some of that has to do with increased testing, but we've also been seeing climbing hospitalization rates. And not only here, but we've been seeing spikes in Florida, in Texas, in Oregon, in California, in Utah. So all, all along the country, about a week to two weeks following phase two openings, we are seeing increase in cases. Now, a lot of that is probably due to lessening of social distancing, more openings, more exposure to people. We are seeing some increased testing, so we expect to see more positive cases as we test more, but I think it's a natural progression as we open things up, people are going to have more exposures and we're gonna see more cases. Now, We've seen these nationwide protests. People are angry about the police brutality. We've seen some horrible things. We've seen horrible images on the, on the news and people are rightfully angry and they're out protesting. What does that mean for the virus? The virus hasn't gone away. It's sort of it lost, we've lost focus on the virus, but it's still there. What does that mean when we have thousands of people out protesting side by side, yelling. We have people getting exposed to tear gas, people getting exposed to bodily fluids. Does that mean that we're gonna see spikes in, in cases? Is that a question? It's not a question. We are gonna see spikes. When are those spikes gonna happen? They're gonna happen you know, seven to 14 days after the protest. So we are going to expect to see cases. And as a matter of fact, if you're out there protesting, you should probably assume that you've been exposed. We're starting to see cities setting up testing locations for protesters. Um, it's going to happen. We're going to. We know that infection is related to exposure. You know, plus time. So if you're out in a group and you're protesting for several hours in close proximity, whether you're wearing a mask or not, you're likely to get exposed. So I'd encourage you to get tested if you've been at a protest because very likely you're going to get exposed and, and you may expose other people. And if, you're in, if you've got people in your family who are at high risk, you've got to really take extra precautions. And it may be a good idea to quarantine yourself if you've been at a protest because you could inadvertently expose somebody. Now onto my favorite you know, subject, hydroxychloroquine. I keep getting dragged in, you know, it's like that, you know, that, that Godfather quote, I try to get out and they keep dragging me back in. So we talked about that observational study from the Lancet that linked hydroxychloroquine use to increase deaths. And again, I explained last week that it's an observational study and observational studies cannot attribute causation. All they can say is it may be an association. Well, 
They had this association with increased numbers of deaths. That study has subsequently been retracted because this small company, apparently that they got their data from, Surgisphere, has, has now come under scrutiny because apparently it popped out of nowhere and they're unwilling to give up their data, meaning that they're not letting people scrutinize where that data came from, quoting confidentiality or whatever else. Well, science requires open sources of data. And if they're not willing to let people scrutinize this data, then the data can't be valid. And so they're retracting the study. Um, again, observation cannot give causation. And they, they pause a lot of studies based on this data. Now, there are currently around 130 ongoing randomly controlled trials looking at the use of hydroxychloroquine in the setting of coronavirus. Now, the very first results of a randomly controlled trial were just released. A study was published in, um, uh, the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, or JAMA, I can't remember which one, looking at um, 821 patients that had a high-risk exposure. So these were people that were either ex were exposed to somebody that had COVID, either household comp uh, contact or healthcare contact, and they were randomly assigned to either a placebo group or a hydroxychloroquine group. And they were given hydroxychloroquine or placebo, the placebo was folate, and they were given that drug for five days following within four days of exposure. And they were followed to see whether or not they developed, um, developed symptoms. And essentially 12% of the people that got hydroxychloroquine developed symptoms and 14% of the group that did not get, uh, they got placebo developed symptoms not statistically uh, uh, significant. So equal numbers of people developed symptoms either getting hydroxychloroquine versus didn't get it. Now, before you yell at me that they didn't get zinc, yes, actually a subgroup of the hydroxychloroquine um, uh, segment got zinc and vitamin C as well. And that group got symptoms just as, as often as a group that didn't get zinc. So no difference at all. So that's an actual study that you can actually draw conclusions from. So in that randomly distributed group, hydroxychloroquine did not prevent people from getting coronavirus. Now, caveats to that study, the symptoms were largely self-reported. Not everybody actually got tested for coronavirus. They just looked for symptoms. It was a relatively young, healthy group. So, but it's the first randomly controlled trial and it's, it supports what a lot of doctors have seen that it hasn't really had much of an effect. That same group that did that study is actually um, analyzing the, the study. They've, they've completed another study where they're give, they've given hydroxychloroquine with zinc and without zinc versus placebo to a group of, of hospitalized patients as well. They have not yet published that study, the data rather. They're still analyzing the data, but they'll be publishing it soon. So it'll be interesting to see what those results are. But that's the first actual published randomly controlled trial. It did not show that hydroxychloroquine was effective. But, you know, that's an actual real randomly controlled trial. First of 131 that are currently pending. They've restarted many of these other studies that were paused based on that Lancet study. Um, next week, we are going to be starting to talk about whether high, um, coronavirus and, and COVID may be a vascular disease. We've, we've talked about this before, about the fact that we think that the virus binds to this ACE2 receptor. We've seen associations with blood clots, um, low oxygen saturations, and I do believe that, that it is a vascular disease. I think that I had a, a conversation with a, with a friend of mine yesterday about, um, and, and realized after talking to him that, that there's an interesting distinction. He was talking to me about the difference between influenza and COVID. And I think there's an important distinction that, that maybe a lot of people don't realize that the difference between influenza and COVID-19 is that realize that influenza doesn't kill people. People don't die of influenza. What happens when people die of the flu is that they develop the flu and it, it, it suppresses their immune system and then they, they get secondary infections and they die of those. So people get influenza and then they develop a pneumonia or some kind of secondary infection and that's what kills them. About 80% of the people that develop COVID die of COVID. They, divide, they die of, of complications related directly to the virus, pulmonary complications, vascular complications. So the virus actually kills people in COVID 
directly. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, and it, it may be semantics, but the virus itself actually kills. Um, and I think some of these vascular things are important to understand. There was an interesting paper that came out that shows that ACE inhibitors, um, these medicines that um, a lot of people take for blood pressure, um, may actually be protective in the setting of COVID-19, and that's important. And so I think next week's um, coronavirus update, um, we're going to really look at the vascular um, aspects of the disease and these issues with blood clots, with ACE inhibitors, and some of the vascular aspects of it, oxygen saturations and things like that. Um, early next week, we are going to do a wellness topic talking about why is it so difficult to lose weight. And I'm going to talk about some of the metabolic, hormonal, behavioral things that go into weight loss and why it's so difficult not only to lose weight, but to keep weight off. And I think we'll be posting that Monday. Um, I'm actually going to probably do, a, I may do a little uh, just lifestyle pep talk thing this weekend. I'm actually taking the family to the Outer Banks to escape this weekend. And I may do a, a, a brief uh, just a health and wellness, uh, my, get your mind right, take a deep breath, brief post this weekend. I may not, depending on how much fun we're having at the beach. We're just going to be gone for a couple days, but there will be a wellness update on Monday. Uh, we may do a Facebook Live towards the end of the week next week. I'm going to see if I can get Dr. Hogan Camp to come back on. I think that was fairly popular. That may be the end of next week. I do need to um, do a shout out. I was talking to my friend, Michelle Effinger, and she was telling me about her friend, Brenda Layton, who's been a big fan of the video broadcast. So I want to give a shout out to Brenda. Thanks for, for watching. As usual, everybody, wash your hands. Take care of yourselves, take care of your families, look out for those around you, stay safe, enjoy the weekend, and we'll be back next week. Have a great night.